Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Channel 71 News Debrief. Uh, this will be the first debrief of the City Council session. Uh, it was a short uh, City Council meeting, just uh, under an hour before they went to executive session. Um, and we'll be talking uh, a little bit about the uh, president that was chosen. Um, there is a resolution about the MTA communities uh, plan. Um, we'll talk a little bit uh, about the Fernald, a little bit about the Fitch, and a little bit about the farm, the three Fs of Walton. Um, today, we are joined by Josh Kessler. Hello, everyone. Emily Speria. Hello. And James Kerkelly. Hello, everyone. Um, and so the first thing, uh, mostly just to gloss over it, the fact that I was wrong in my prediction. Uh, I predicted uh, last week at our session wrap up that John McLaughlin would ascend to the throne of presidency. Um, no one else agreed with me, and you were all right. Um, Kathleen Beaton became city council president uh, once again for her second term. Um, it's not surprising at all. Uh, she's well liked as the president. Um, she runs a pretty good meeting. Um, she's been on there for 40 years. Uh, all around, just, you know, I've got very little complaints uh, from a president uh, point of view. Not surprised. Yeah, not surprised. Um, and John McLaughlin as well, uh, VP, uh, continuing. Very little. We'll get the committee. Uh, Assignments uh, where the city councilors sit in, the, um, as well as the committee or chairs as well. Um, generally, uh, people that aren't me aren't interested in committee chairs um, because it, it's like really not that important, but it is an election year and people will use those titles um, while they knock on doors. So I am curious who actually gets those chairs. Um, it is. Uh, it should be noted that you know every time a, a campaign happens, we're we're like, oh, email the the committee of so and so, um, and it shows all the list of the people that are committee. It should. Uh, I, I like I like reminding people that um, anything that goes from a committee to the full council, which is everything, everything goes from uh, needs a vote at a committee, and then that vote is voted on in the full city council. Um, uh, and so every counselor has a say on every matter. And also any counselor can speak at any committee as long as there's a friendly vote to hear from off committee members, which I've only seen it not happen once. And that was during the school debacle and someone and, and some counselors didn't want the mayor to speak. And so they just didn't let her speak. And so it's generally uh, generally all counselors can speak at everything. It's just kind of easier to say those things. And it's kind of nice being able to say that you're in the public works, public safety committee, when in reality, a lot of counselors speak at every public works and public safety committee, despite not being on that committee. Um, moving on. to see if anyone else or what, how the committees get switched up, especially for like the master plan committee. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in five seconds. Uh, I've got some more thoughts on the master plan committee. Um, so there was a, a resolution um, that George Darcy uh, authored and Colleen signed on to um, that was looking at ways that Waltham can get into compliance with the uh, what, what what's the title of that MBTA's community plan. Community, uh, it's like the community choice. MBTA communities law. Communities better law. bus communities. Yeah, better bus communities law. Yeah, of course. That thing. Um, and uh, so, like, I really thought this was going to be a little more heated than it was because what George is essentially saying uh, is that the mayor is wrong. The mayor, um, you know, we talked about this in the past, is that while they made uh, the cover of the Boston Globe uh, for essentially uh, not responding to uh, the law, and we are in the process of losing three hundred thousand dollars unless we do something about it. Um, and this was an intentional uh, thing by the mayor. She just wants to accept the punishments for not doing this because she thinks the law is bad. Um, and George is essentially writing a resolution that says, "What do we have to do to get in compliance with this? Forget what the mayor is saying. We should be doing this anyway." Um, and I really think. This might be a little performative 
because I'm pretty sure that the mayor decides to do this. Um, I don't think anybody, I don't think the city council decides to do this. Um, I think it's John Gollinger, the head of the housing and the mayor and John Gollinger is appointed by the mayor. Um, and so, you know, we can talk just like Better Bus uh, resolution that George uh, authored. We can talk about uh, where the city failed and where the mayor failed, um, but I don't really see this making Waltham come into compliance. Do you have a thought, Josh, before I can- I, I have something to add on that. Okay, so I was looking at the online. Uh, so Christine told us about this already um, when she was on, but I was looking online at the state website about what compliance means. So there's sort of two parts to this. So right now the city just literally has to submit an online form. Mm -hmm. And presumably that's the job of someone in the mayor's office. I don't think it's the housing director. So I'm not sure whose job it is, but I believe that all the city has to do is send in a form by the end of this month and we get the $300,000. But there's no way to know if the city's planning on doing that because the one clue we don't know whether it didn't happen because of a mistake or it didn't happen because the mayor's made a choice to ignore the law she made a comment in one meeting which suggested she had made a choice to ignore the law in that case maybe she's not going to send in that form because that would set a precedent that we're actually doing this um so we don't know if that's happening so but then there's two parts so then in order to be in compliance the next step is that the city council would have to make actually make changes to our zoning laws and if i understand correctly they would have to until the end of 2024 to do that so if that's part of their master planning process, then in, if they, in fact, in the master plan committee figure these things out, there's still time for them to do that before the end of 2024. There's also time for us to elect new people <laughs> to do that before the end of 2024. But as far as this form that needs to be sent in right away, I don't think anyone knows whether it's happening and I don't know if the resolution um, has any um, wait one other thing that was significant here well one thing that was significant was it was um, Councillor Darcy and Councillor Bradley MacArthur working together because we were wondering in our last episode when a more established councillor would co-introduce something with her so that has now happened so that was nice but the other thing that was significant is Councillor Stanley stood up and said just so everyone knows, I already submitted a resolution about this. And Councillor McMenamin said, yes, that was from a prior session and we voted not to carry it over. Otherwise, this new resolution would be out of order. That's pretty significant because it means that in a prior session, someone made an attempt to get the council working on this and they didn't. At some point, they must have had to take a vote to, to drop it off of their docket, probably at their, their last meeting of that year. And so... Um, you know, that's another clue that the city is choosing to ignore this, um, that it wasn't a mistake about just not submitting a form. So um, I think actually how the uh, city council mechanics work is that at the end of the session, you have to vote on what you would like to carry over, not what you would like not to carry over. So I think what happened was that that piece of legit, that that resolution or ordinance or whatever Tom Stanley submitted was probably a resolution is that it wasn't carried over. So not necessarily voted down, um, but not voted through. Um, it also could have been filed. I, I don't remember. Apparently I was watching city council at this time because uh, it was only a couple of years ago, but I honestly don't remember this resolution. Um, something inter else interesting that happened with this uh, resolution is that uh, afterwards, um, Randy LeBlanc uh, rose as a point of information that that there were, I wish I could remember his exact words, uh, that in the master plan committee, they were having people, uh, zoning professionals and, uh, and uh, planners in their committee. And so it, it, this big picture idea on, on uh, planning in Waltham, it made sense to go to this committee. Kathleen Big Miniman, uh, the city council president, agreed and sent it over uh, to the master plan committee. Um, and it feels like I'm taking fucking crazy pills because this committee does not meet. It doesn't meet. It's not real. It's not a real committee. And well, when it meets, it's only for public input. Yeah. And yeah. No, like, I feel like. I'm literally taking crazy people. I, when, she, when that happened, I was like, wait, 
has this committee been meeting the whole time and I'm just like missing it somehow? I really like, I, but to be clear, the master plan committee has not met on the public floor one time in over a year of existence. It has met for the listening sessions. And I guess they're like emailing back and forth, which is a whole can of worms and mo open meeting law violations. But like yes. they, haven't, they, have, they haven't met at a public floor once. So what are all these zoning professionals so meeting? When they players? conduct the public hearings, does that not count as meeting? Well, uh, that, is, that is meeting. meeting that, the, is, that is technically meeting, but yeah, they're like only doing public. Meeting, but yeah. that, is the, that is then holding a quorum. So they're by, they're, they're satisfying the open meeting law and all that type of stuff. But like, it's not like they're debating anything and they're not deliberating on anything. You know, yeah. that is the great way point. to say it is there's decisions that have been made that we didn't see made in the public meeting. Like originally they announced a certain set of meetings and then that last meeting got changed to something else and we don't know where that decision got made. At some point they decided to bring in consultants at some point they did. So when did those decisions get made? Either yeah, they in a meeting we didn't know about or it was somehow behind the scenes, which it's not really how it's supposed to work. Yeah, I'd be very I see surprised. what you're saying. Yeah. I'd be very saying. surprised uh, if it was a meeting that, didn't, that we just don't know about. Um, and so, so there's also precedent for the the staff for these things to do to meet and do stuff and mm -hmm. not have it be an open meeting violation so who knows just to say how much is actually happening that way yeah i fairly confident they're just like emailing back and forth i want these emails um i really want them to just meet and they have a really long agenda for their first meeting because all of george darcy's resolutions are waiting to be so the queue of meeting, a queue of uh, resolutions waiting. Yeah, and so, but it, it also bothers me because, like, like who decides what is big picture Waltham ideas and gets sent to the master plan committee? Uh, you know, it could be argued that any resolution is just like part of the planning of Waltham. Why aren't they all being sent that way? Why is it just George Darcy's resolutions that are all? cool resolutions that I want to see talked about. Why is it those ones that are getting sent to the master plan committee limbo? Uh, the um, Fitch was talked about uh, very briefly in the sense that they went to executive session, not much to talk about there, except that it seems like we're going to soon understand what the uh, fate of the Fitch is, um, which is a school off of uh, Crescent Street. Um, people have been talking about it for years, what they're going to do with this old decrepit school uh, that hasn't been used in 20 years. And there was an executive session on the appraisal um, with the potential of not going into executive session. It did, but it was the first time I've actually seen the docket, the words potential. Um, and so I feel like we're almost there. We're almost going to figure out what the fish is for. I used to think, the last time this was on the public floor in the city council, Kathy Ann Harris said that it was going to be a rec center, a recreation center. Um, I'm being told by little birdies in my ear that that's no longer what's going to happen, but uh, I don't actually know what that, what the new idea is, um, and that is being discussed in the session. At the end of the city council docket, um, the farm had uh, several documents uh, listed, but I, what I should say is that the mayor had several documents listed that talked about the farm, which is Rule 58 uh, for information rules only. Um, in it, it outlines like her plans for the farm. Uh, it outlines some uh, legal documents associated with the farm. Apparently, one of the sentences is that everyone was asking for these things. Um, this actually wasn't talked about um, on the city council floor, which I was a little disappointed by. Uh, these things aren't necessarily um, part of the docket of the day, but because they are within the docket, any counselor can take that off the table. And I, the, we know the mayor was there because she was right there. So I am a little disappointed that the counselors uh, didn't uh, take it off the floor and ask the mayor about these things. Um, any counselor could have done that and none did. Um, so I was a little disappointed about that. Um, we did learn a few things about the farm. I'm curious if anyone has any uh, interesting takes on. Uh, what we learned from there. Okay, so this is the e-docket from the city council meeting. So this is public. You can find it uh, uh, on the city website, and you can see these links down at the bottom that these are just informational. They weren't discussed at the meeting, as Chris said. Um, but one of the most important ones is there's a memo that says goals for the site. 
and it says that the um, mayor uh, intends to see um, both community gardens and um, a CSA type farm there. So that seems to say that when they sent out that survey about the community gardens, that wasn't intended to be instead of the farm. Although it's funny, they had a picture of the, of the current farm out there. So it was, I can understand why people were confused by that. Uh, there was someone who, when these documents came out, there was someone who posted them on next door with an introduction, kind of like all those people who doubted the mayor and her <laughs> intentions have been proven wrong. She didn't say it exactly like that, but something like this, you know, putting this out there as, as, as sort of disproving all the misinformation that was out there. And you remember when we talked about this last, it really bothered me that there were these claims of misinformation, but we didn't know exactly what it was. So I wanted to take a look at what this debunks and doesn't debunk. Apparently there were some people who thought the property was gonna be sold for condos. I don't know how many. Um, Councillor Cates had a statement on Facebook where he referenced that. So this kind of debunks that because it says that legally it has to be used for, um, it has to be used for agricultural, educational, and recreational purposes. They don't have the option to sell it to use as condos. Um, the, other thing though, is it includes this map, which is very similar to the map that the Waltham Land Trust sent out and that some people seem to be implying contained misinformation, but this shows that it was correct in the main regard, which is that they're splitting the land approximately in half and area two, which is gonna be closed for remediation, contains much of what is now Waltham Community Farms and including the greenhouses. It doesn't address the question that we thought was the main question at play, which is why does it have to be um, cut up in this way? It doesn't exactly answer that, but it does say that the remediation includes evaluating and po probably demolishing some of the structures on the site, including the greenhouses. I don't know if the farm people knew that apart before, maybe they did, but that sort of clarifies why all the buildings are in this area because they consider that part of the remediation. The other thing the Waltham Land Trust map showed that this doesn't show is where they believe the um, contamination is, which is just down at this end. So it doesn't, it, it opened the question of why do they need to shut down this whole area? This map doesn't show where they believe the contamination to be, and it didn't really, um, clarify that at all, except to say that they're going to look at the buildings. Um, this, uh, the packet also included information about 30B, which is the state law um, that governs whenever a city or town government is going to sell or lease property um, to a private party, they have to follow a specific process that's outlined the state law. Um, it does appear that it applies to this case because it's we're trying to do a lease for them. Um, so if anybody thought that the mayor was being capricious and requiring this process, it kind of debunks that. But I don't know if anyone actually said that. It does seem like this process is legally required to do a lease. And uh, we don't necessarily have to give the firm a lease in order for them to use the land. Um, like UMass, for example, had a license agreement. But my understanding, and, and Emily may know more about this, is that the farm wants a lease because they need that to have the security that they're going to be there for a certain amount of time. So we do need to do this 30B process. The packet also includes reminders that by state law, elected officials can't collude with anyone who might be making a proposal. So that's why the mayor is saying a third, uh, CSA farm, she's not specifying Waltham Fields Community Farm because she doesn't want to imply they've already got it. They have to go through this process. Um, but it didn't include a definition of colluding. Um, so this kind of makes sense if you think about it like, you know, this is a very popular organization, but if you can imagine a, a more controversial organization was about to get a lease on taxpayer land that they could profit from. Um, and that decision was if, if there were counselors meeting with them behind closed doors to work that out, we might not like that because it, it not only does it give one person an unfair advantage, but it, it opens the door for corruption because there could be a quid pro quo there. So the mayor saying that, so I think the reason the mayor included this in the packet was to explain why she and the counselors have not sat down and had a meeting with the farm leaders about a transition plan because they're not allowed to do that because that could be considered colluding. But it seems to me, I'm not a lawyer, but it seems the big question is, does this law limit when you can say to the public 
because if you tell your the public your intentions for the land, then you're necessarily telling all the potential bidders too. And in fact, that's what this uh, memo did. It says the mayor's intentions for the land. So it kind of begs the question of why didn't she put out this memo back in the middle of December if this memo had been the cover page for that huge packet, 3,700 page packet, this whole debate would have gone completely differently because she would have acknowledged upfront that there is no plan to get rid of the farm. Maybe she's trying to get rid of that particular organization and have someone else run the farm, but that seems unlikely from what we see here. So it's like, in a way, it kind of vindicates the mayor on some points, um, depending on what it was people were trying to criticize her about. But it also begs the question of why she didn't just share this information at the beginning of the process. Why does it always have to be afterwards? You know, we gotcha. You thought it was one thing and it was really another. Why didn't we just know up front? So um, yeah, so that's why, so these papers can contain a lot of good new information. I don't think that they really vindicate or uh, 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 debunk anything that was being said about the farm, except for the people who said she was going to sell it for condos. I think that it debunks that. And so I'm still curious, what was the misinformation that counselors were seeing? Um, I don't think they're, I think what they mean is that there was, people were ascribing a motive to the mayor. They thought she wanted to get rid of the farm. But that's not really misinformation. That's an interpretation of her actions. Um, so, in turn, so uh, these papers are very interesting, but I don't think that they um, really prove that there was mis misinformation out there. I think there's just one more issue we have to talk about tonight for the show, which is there's a meeting coming up next Thursday, a public hearing of the Conservation Commission to discuss the mayor's recreational plans for the Fernal. So I think that's an important meeting and I just wanted to catch people up. We've talked about this on the show before, but about a year ago, there was another public hearing on this same recreational plan and it was sponsored by the recreation department. And the po point of the hearing was for people to give comments on the specifics of this recreational plan. They had an engineer there to discuss it, but many people showed up to the meeting and almost all of them wanted to talk about appropriately memorializing the land or other uses of the land other than recreation. Um, and so, that uh, could happen again at this Conservation Commission meeting, because I assume that the Conservation Commission is expecting to look at this strictly from a conservation point of view. Um, but the problem is that part of this recreational plan includes a memorial. And um, it's not clear if that is the only memorial for the whole Fernald, which is a really important part of history that needs to be memorialized appropriately. It's not clear who came up with the design for this memorial and if anyone from the disability community was involved in that. The Conservation Commission probably is not expecting to talk about this issue, but the problem is the Historical Commission does not need to approve this recreational plan because apparently what I found out is there were historical restrictions on some parts of the property, but this isn't one of them. Also, the mayor needs approval from the Historical Commission to knock down buildings, but this doesn't involve knocking down buildings. So it won't be approved. It won't be reviewed by the Historical Commission. It won't be reviewed by the Disability Commission. It won't be reviewed by anybody who is qualified to say if this is appropriate. Is this an appropriate memorial? Um, so I think what may happen is people are going to show up at the Conservation Commission and ask them to either either vote no or put off a decision on this um, till we get some assurance that there will be an appropriate um, plan to memorialize this space. And this is just one part of the property. There are other things going on other parts. I know that um, the Historic Commission approved converting one building on the site into, I think, two units of housing, and that's already underway. So there's lots going on at the site. And this is this is very similar to the, the controversy with the farm and the field station, because we don't know what the mayor's intentions are. So we can come in and complain about what her intentions are, and then she might come back later and say, no, I was never going to do that. Um, but that's basically the problem here, is that different committees are being asked to um, approve a different parts of the plan without knowing the whole plan and whether it's appropriate from the point of view of memorializing that site. 
So if this is an issue you follow, the Fernald, if this is something that's important to you, you may want to show up at that meeting on Thursday. It's going to be on Zoom, and the Zoom link is supposed to be posted on the city website two days before the meeting. Did anyone have any more to say on that? I just urge people to show up if they'd like to give some input on that matter. I know a lot of um, a lot of people have had some different comments about what's actually on the the proposed plan so definitely looking forward to hearing what people have to say yeah thank you so i mean it says on the plan that there's a memorial and there'll be historic information on the site and it says there's a braille wall and i don't know if a braille wall means there's a wall that says the same historical information on braille or if that means it's a wall that like sighted kids can put on a blindfold and try to find their way around the wall either way that seems like a really inappropriate memorial for an institution for people with intellectual disabilities and but my opinion doesn't matter the point is that somebody who can speak for the disability community has to be involved in this and it looks like the process currently does not allow for that so it may be a frustrating meeting with the Conservation Commission because there may be people there to say to try to just shut down this process because it's going in the wrong direction. All right, any other issues I'm forgetting about? Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Miriam and Zoe, for coming on the show. Those were really great interviews. Thank you to Chris for setting those up. And uh, we will hopefully see many of you at our event next Wednesday night. Um, we'll see you there. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone. Cheers. Take care.